Hello, my name is Dr. Carolyn Baum. I'm a professor of occupational therapy at Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri. My colleague, Dr. Joy Hamill, a professor at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and I are investigators on the NIDER sponsored Medical Rehabilitation Outcomes Grant. We have prepared this module to introduce you to the importance, selection, and use of outcome measures in your clinical practice. The objectives for this module are to, one, understand the changing medical system and the changing focus of assessments, two, to understand how the International Classification of Disability and Function, the ICF, are changing the measurement approach, three, for you to be able to describe outcomes at all levels of the ICF, Four, to understand how the delivery of rehabilitation will rely on measures to triage, plan care, and build new rehabilitation services. Five, the importance of participation. Six, what influence participation, what influences participation. Seven, relationship of constructs to support participation, and eight, the importance of documenting outcomes. Medical rehabilitation is experiencing a paradigm shift. While rehabilitation will continue to be delivered in hospitals, rehabilitation facilities, nursing homes, and in people's homes, it will be expanding to community programs where services like self-management health promotion and prevention of secondary conditions will be delivered to promote health. People who require medical rehabilitation experience problems in their ability to communicate, their ability to move, and their ability to do the things that are necessary to fulfill the responsibilities and interests in their daily lives. People may experience a change in roles. For example, they may not be able to work, their role as a husband or wife may change, and what they do with their children is often altered. They may have to assume new activities associated with basic self-care, hygiene, their sexual function, and they may have to assume new tasks to get through their daily lives. Whatever their experience, they often have a gap between what they want and what they need to do and often they face a chronic health condition because their health must be managed to prevent secondary conditions. Occupational therapy, physical therapy, and speech-language pathology have major roles to play in bridging between the medical model of care where patients receive treatment to recover and community care where people receive services to improve their health and reduce the cost of care. Outcome data will be central to understanding the needs of patients, their level of care, and the services that will enhance their movement, communication, and performance in all elements central to improved quality of life. Since 2001, the community of rehabilitation has come together using a language and classification system. The International Classification of Function and Disability, again the ICF, is the World Health Organization's classification system which identifies the major factors that support function and disability. It also identifies all the dimensions that require measures to produce data so we can understand the relationship between body functions and body structures, activity and participation, and the personal and environmental factors that impact health and function. You can access the ICF by visiting the World Health Organization's website. The left side of the ICF is highlighted here to bring attention to the language and factors of the ICF that were the focus when medical rehabilitation operated within the medical model and the idea of disability was thought to be a problem with the person that needed rehabilitation to recover. Beginning in the 1990s, the leadership of the disability community asked rehabilitation professionals to consider that disability occurs 
when there are environmental barriers that limit their capacity to participate in the social experiences and roles that were meaningful and limited and were meaningful and those that limited their ability to make choices. Now we look at the whole classification system being highlighted. With the implementation of the ICF, there's been a paradigm shift that now has added participation in environmental factors to the classification and requires new measures to be used by rehabilitation professionals to address all of the constructs to complete the classification that will support the understanding of health and function. The changing rehabilitation paradigm is depicted in this slide. Traditionally, rehabilitation has been delivered in institutional models. Hospitals, home health, rehabilitation facilities, skilled nursing facilities. The goal always being to return people to home and community life represented in the community participation section of this figure. Unfortunately, the continual reduction in the length of stay in our institutional services makes it virtually impossible for people to have full recoveries that support community integration in the limited days authorized for inpatient care. Short-term stays are creating opportunities for outpatient and community programs that extend opportunities for rehabilitation. Rehabilitation research is informing the interventions that have the potential to help people move from the acute episode of care to community participation. Take a moment to look at this slide. All of the programs listed, opportunities for mass training, virtual training strategies, assistive technology and robotics, driving assessment and training, communication strategies, home assessment and management, strategies to support learning for performance, family and patient training, return to work training and accommodations, relationships with independent living centers and vocational rehabilitation, enabling mobility, post rehab fitness, social opportunities and self-management strategies for home, work and community. All these programs require data to guide the need for the program and the outcome data to show the effectiveness of the program in returning people to community life. An important opportunity for the use of rehabilitation measures to guide the rehabilitation process. This table based on the ICF was designed to show the constructs that clinicians can use in selecting measures to guide their clinical plans. The overall objective of rehabilitation is to foster participation. From the medical perspective, the focus is on recovery. The focus on the environment adds a compensatory approach. Both approaches are necessary to enhance participation, which leads to improved quality of life. This table was constructed to serve as a reference tool and will be used later in this module. You will see some familiar constructs on this table. Each discipline will have different contributions to make. The goal, however, is for the different professions to address different issues in their measurement so that all of the constructs together address problems that the patient or client is facing and requires rehabilitation. There are a number of reasons to focus on participation. The disability community mandates that we address participation disparities. People with disabilities want rehabilitation professionals to help them understand what has happened to them and help them gain the skills to do what is important to them. Healthcare is placing a focus on primary, secondary prevention, because the healthier the person is, the less it costs. Maintaining health is not as costly as recovering health. Healthcare policy and reimbursement priorities are changing trends in delivery. There is now much more emphasis on community-based care. People that require rehabilitation often have a chronic health condition that must be managed, and the rehabilitation professionals are in a perfect position 
to help people gain the skills to manage their own health. There are several compelling reasons for documenting outcomes, particularly outcomes related to activity and participations. Meeting individual clients' needs and priorities. What are the client's goals? What do they want to do? Also, ensuring individual civil rights to fully participate in society after rehabilitation is mandated within the American with Disabilities Act. Many people who receive rehabilitation need to have clinicians focus on returning to work, and many will require accommodations. Responding to a growing call for activity and participation outcome documentation by funders and those providing services. The next slide will look at three initiatives that are requiring a focus on activity and participation. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, has funded expansion of the Home and Community-Based Waiver and other programs in states to provide needed services and supports to transition to or remain in the least restrictive community-based setting and to prevent or delay nursing home or institutional placement. These supports include equitable access to needed therapy services, assistive technology, home modifications, and personal attendance. The address, the web um, address for more details on this is listed on the slide. The Commission on Accreditation of Rehabilitation Facilities requires therapists address and document participation for any facility applying for stroke specialty programs, stating that intervention should focus on community integration and participation in life roles. Also, the Affordable Care Act of 2010 further highlights the provision of community-based services and supports to people with disabilities and older Americans particularly for those who would otherwise not qualify for or be able to afford such services. You can get more details from the web address that is listed on the slide. Participation and activities are emphasized in the ICF as an important element of health functioning and disability, and there is a growing body of research examining participation interventions and their impact on health, as well as on how to rigorously assess participation outcomes. These points present a compelling case for rehabilitation to include participation in our outcome plans and evidence-based research. The following content provides a summary of how to assess rehabilitation outcomes across the ICF categories and how to use this information to guide evidence-based interventions in rehabilitation. What influences participation? Let's take a look. First, we have to understand that participation as defined by the ICF is participating in a life situation. Those life situations are caring for self, caring for others, maintenance of home, work activities, fitness activities, leisure and sport activities, community activities, social activities, and religious and spiritual activities. These are all the things we do every day and the things people with disabilities want to do. There are a number of person factors that may limit or enhance capacity. These must be identified. They include cognition, physiology, sensory, motor, psychological, and spiritual. The ICF and models like the Person Environment Occupational Performance Model place an equal emphasis on environmental factors. These include factors like social support, social capital, cultural, the physical environment, assistive technology or tools. All these factors have the potential to influence, limit, or support a person's participation. Therapists need to be able to access measures to identify capacities, 
facilitators and barriers. We also must recognize that the patients we serve have spoken and they put their own perspective on participation. People with disabilities want what everyone else wants. They want respect and to maintain their dignity. They want to be part of things. They want to do what is meaningful to them. They want to be responsible things on a personal and societal level. They also want to have an impact and provide support for others. They want to have social connections, be included, and be members of groups. It is no surprise that they want access to and have opportunities to go anywhere they want to go, and they want to make their own choices and have control over who they are and what they do. Participation involves consideration of the environment. The environmental taxonomy used in this project includes five major constructs which can and should be measured in outpatient and community-based clients. They include the use of products and technology, both the natural and the human-made environment, support and relationships, attitudes and services, systems and policies. This module is designed to ask you to apply what you have learned. Through a case study, we will offer examples of how you can incorporate rehabilitation outcomes into your practice. My colleague Joy Hemmel is now going to take over the narration of Module 2. Hi, this is Joy Hamill from the University of Illinois at Chicago. I'll be taking you through the second half of this module. And the first thing we'd like you to do is begin to meet our case study client, who we'll be working with throughout the rest of the module so you can decide how to choose outcome assessments and measures with him. The case study that we'll be using um, is a gentleman named John, who's a 52-year-old man uh, who had a right parietal CVA, um, has gone through acute care, and is now currently receiving inpatient rehabilitation. What I'd like you to do now is read the next two slides that give you more information about John, because that will help us in our outcome planning. Okay, now that you've looked at John's case, what we'd like you to do is go back to that ICF um, framework that Carolyn Baum talked about. And we want you to um, begin to fill it out for John in terms of what kinds of outcomes you would like to assess with him. So if you look at the next slide, it gives you a blank worksheet to use. And we want you to think about what would you be assessing in terms of outcomes with John in relation to body structure and function, in relation to activity performance, in relation to participation engagement, and also in the environment. Try to think across all of these categories as you do this worksheet. The next thing we'd like to cover then is how you can use these outcome measures um, both as ways to begin to set your goals as well as to measure the outcomes of those goals. And the first thing we want to talk about is a major trend in goal setting is using patient reported outcomes. Sometimes they're called self-report, subjective, client-centered practice or goal setting and outcomes. There's a growing movement called patient engagement and patient activation that we'll talk more about throughout the module. Sometimes they're called consumer-directed outcomes and programming if they're coming from within the disability and aging communities. And we have a whole area of research called community-based participatory research and patient-centered outcomes research that's also a growing trend in our healthcare now. All of these are based on a client-centered philosophy, which really the goal is to be able to have clients gain their own power in making their own healthcare decisions and in directing those decisions. So some of the basic assumptions of a client-centered philosophy are that clients know themselves best as well as their families know them too, um, and that each client or family is different and unique. And so you want them to be able to set their own goals to be able to guide what's most important to them. 
and we also know that optimal client functioning occurs within a supportive family and community context. In this case, the support for you is being able to use client-centered goals to begin to target your interventions. There's also some compelling research that tells us why using a client-centered philosophy makes a difference in our interventions, and that is that clients who set goals achieve better outcomes than those who do not. When we look to the research, it may be because setting goals focuses a person's attention and directs his efforts. We also know that establishing challenging but realistic goals leads to greater effort. People will persist longer when they're doing things. We know that challenging goals also leads to better and higher performance versus just encouraging the person to do their best. And we know that setting goals prompts the person to apply or develop their skills to achieve that goal, to actually meet that outcome. And we know that goal achievement and outcome attainment requires ongoing feedback. So we need to remember that when we use client-centered goals, we need to then come back to them and reassess people's outcomes and give them feedback so they know where they have been and where they are going to. So let's look at some definitions, um, particularly related to patient-reported outcome measures and how you might use them as an outcome measure. The first one is what is a PRO, or a patient reported outcome, and that's basically the self-report of a patient's health condition that comes directly from that patient or client or consumer. In some cases, you might also see it coming from a caregiver or other proxy, but increasingly the research is showing that if it's possible to come directly from the client or consumer themselves, that is more indicative of them. And we use PROs to be able to document individual status and to set goals. A PROM, or Patient Reported Outcome Measure, is when you use a validated instrument or a scale or a single item measure to assess that patient reported outcome. So we use it to document individual outcomes over time in a validated way. And then finally, a PRO PM is a patient reported outcome performance measure or system. This is a system that has a number of different assessments in it and allows you to measure these patient reported outcomes across a service, across a program, or across a group of your clients that you're seeing to be able to document treatment impact and effectiveness. So let's go through some patient reported outcome measures so you can get an example of what they look like and ones that you might be able to use in your everyday practice. I want to focus in on PROs that specifically look at measuring activity and participation in context. One PRO that does that is the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, or the COPM, which helps clients identify their issues and goals in three areas of functioning, self-care, productivity, and leisure. And the client self-reports on a 1 to 10 scale how well they think they are performing, how satisfied they are with that performance, and how important that area is to them. So we can see in this slide an example of the COPM done with John, our case client. And you can see here that it's basically an interview about his day. That then becomes different areas of activities that he's working on. John then rates how important those activities are to him. And then he chooses his top five activities that he most wants to work on right now in rehabilitation. He then rates himself on how well he thinks he's performing and how satisfied he is. And you can see here some issues that John has identified in his COPM related to both his performance and satisfaction with his top five areas of goals. What we'd like you to, to do now as an activity is look back at that last slide and John's results on the COPM. And think about these questions. What were John's most important goals to him? Which areas of the ICF do these goals correspond to? How would you use the COPM to document client goals, not only to John, but potentially also to his wife and or to the funder of his rehabilitation? And how would you use these goals then to inform your intervention, as well as to be able to show changes in outcomes over time to John and to the funder? Go ahead and try this now and see what you think with the COPM and John's results.
The COPM is also an example of a PROM, or measure, because it's been validated as a measure over decades of use across thousands of clients across Canada and many other countries. It's been validated to be able to show changes over time and goal attainment in performance and satisfaction from a client perspective. You can also use it potentially to compare it to family and significant other or clinician ratings. And the COPM has been incorporated into many electronic medical records, such as at the Rehabilitation Institute of Chicago, again showing that this can be an important patient reported outcome well worth um, recording and documenting for a funder as well. Another example of a patient reported outcome measure that allows you to look at activity and participation is the activity card sort by Carolyn Baum. And here you're seeing an example of the score sheet for the activity card sort done with John. The card sort is basically a number of different cards, each of which has a picture of an activity on it. And you ask the client whether or not they have, are continuing to do this activity since their event, such as their stroke or spinal cord injury. Once they tell you that, you then talk about are you doing it as much as you used to in the past, or have you given it up? Or is this something new that you've acquired since, since your stroke? So you can see here for John that there's several activities that since his stroke, he has not been doing as much as he used to before the stroke, or he's given them up. So these are areas that are prime areas for focusing in our interventions. Another example of a PRO measure that looks at participation is the Community Participation Indicators, or CPI assessment. This assessment focuses on how often people are engaging in different areas of participation, beginning within their homes, and then it moves on into the community, and then into the workplace and economic and productive um, activities, and then finally in social relationships. The CPI asks the person to self-report on how frequently they're doing these activities, is the activity important to you, and their satisfaction in that are they doing enough of it when they want to or need to. You can see here the results of the CPI under social engagement for John and see that although many of these activities, in fact all, are very important to him, many of them he's not satisfied and feels that he's not doing enough of. The second part of the CPI looks at participation in a different way. It looks at enfranchisement. That is, how much people feel that they are have a sense of community, that they're a part of that community, that they have a voice and a say in it, that they're respected, that they have rights in that community, or they have access to resources so that they can fully engage in that community. So you're seeing here the second part of the CPI that measures enfranchisement and has been validated as a measure. You can see the results here for John as well, um, that in many cases, he is uh, reporting that he isn't able to do many of these um, enfranchisement activities in his life right now, including not able to participate in a variety of activities when he wants to, um, not feeling like he has a say or a membership or role in the community like he used to have, um, and not having access to some of the resources that he had before his stroke. So that gives you some examples of different PRO measures that you could use to look at activity and participation. In this next section, I want to talk about comparing these patient reported outcomes to clinician per objective performance rating measures um, and how you might be able to use both of these as you begin to put together your outcome plan. The first example I want to use is two tests that have been chosen to determine fall risk, a very critical and important item that we work on in rehabilitation. On the left side of the slide, you see a clinical outcome performance measure, the Berg Balance Scale, very widely used to have a person perform a series of activities and to rate their performance on them. On the right, you see a PROM, or a patient reported fall risk scale, called the Activities Balance Confidence Scale, the ABC scale. 
And on this um, self-report, the person talks about how confident they are um, in doing a number of everyday functional activities. So let's take a look at a video now that shows John working on a Berg Balance item, that is, picking up a slipper from the floor. Go ahead and watch the video and uh, see what, what happens with John when you're doing an objective performance task with him. Now, let's look at John's score on the Activity Balance Confidence Scale, his self-report. So even though you saw what was happening with him on the Berg Balance, you can see here when we asked John before he did the task how confident he was in maintaining his balance when he was bending over to pick up a slipper from the floor, he was 90% confident that he would be okay with that, that he, that he was very confident in doing it. And we can see here that he feels very confident in several areas. However, two tasks he was not so confident in, standing on a chair and reaching for something and walking outside on icy sidewalks. So we see there's a mismatch between the patient's self-reporter confidence in his or her balance and his actual activities here. Yet, we know from the self-report that this patient has some self-awareness of particularly threatening activities like standing on a chair or walking on an icy sidewalk. So clinically, this could potentially tell us that we could start by talking about those two high-risk activities and ask why he's so fearful about them, play back even the video of him doing uh, the, the slipper task and picking it up off the floor, and validating with him that there are issues even on that task and beginning to work our intervention around increasing his awareness um, of his fall risk and working on strategies to address that risk. As another example, um, we often are looking at a person's cognitive status or their executive functioning, um, specifically after a stroke. And we can do the same thing here. We can use both a patient report and an objective clinical performance test to look at cognitive status and how it impacts um, people's everyday function. In this case, we're going to use a PROM measure called the Executive Functioning Performance Test, or EFPT, by Carolyn Baum. What I'd like you to do now is watch the video of John as he performs the EFPT. And you'll see that the EFPT has both a self-report first, followed by an objective performance assessment. Here we actually see one of the score sheets from the EFPT, and this tells us those self-report items of how John scored on these four um, very basic yet very critical tasks for everyday participation in the home. That is being able to cook, to make a phone call, to take medication, and to pay his bills. If you look at the medication task on the right side of the page, um, this is what you observed in the video, and you can see where John was at um, before he did the task, and that he predicted he would be able to take his medications all by himself. That was his self-report. When we look at the second page of results from the EFPT, we now see his actual performance that you watched in the video, and we see that John wasn't able to independently take his medications. And indeed, he did require some verbal guidance and some gestural guidance, um, both for organization, for sequencing, and particularly for judgment and safety related to taking medications. And on this third slide of results, we see from the EFPT both the self-report at the top and then the person's actual performance next to it on the right. And then under it, you make a clinical judgment about whether there's a potential awareness problem. And in this case, we can see that John does have a potential safety and awareness issue in underestimating his need for help. And that can target what we then do in an intervention with him. 
So I hope what you're seeing from all these examples is that both patient report and clinician performance rated measures um, are needed in order to get a full view of where the client is at um, as we begin to focus our interventions. And in fact, um, a study in the American Journal of Physical Therapy by Robinson et al. Um, concludes by saying it's important to administer both, that they each give you different pieces of information. The self-report on the person's self-efficacy and beliefs about themselves, the objective performance on their motor and cognitive performance in that task. So what's the added value then? Why would you want to consider adding patient reported outcomes um, to your outcome uh, toolbox? Well, one is it allows you to assess self-awareness, both for the family, but also to see if caregivers are self-aware of these issues or to inform a caregiver that that client may have some awareness issues. It also lets you assess confidence or self-efficacy, which we know from Albert Bandura's work that self-efficacy is very predictive of and can lead to imp improved behavior or performance. We can also take a patient reported outcome and easily translate it into client-centered goals, like what you saw in the COPM. So you can measure changes in these outcomes over time as yet another outcome indicator. And PROs allow you to share outcomes with the clients so they can see their own improvements and changes over time, further increase their confidence, and ergo increase their performance and outcomes too. Another added value of patient reported outcomes, it is helps you to assess, quote, readiness to change or patient activation are some of the buzzwords that you hear in the healthcare um, research right now. And what these are talking about is where is that client at right now in terms of being able to change their behaviors? How ready are they to be able to take your instructions and your interventions and actually use them in their everyday life? The patient activation measure, or the PAM, is an example of a patient reported outcome that has a person's self rate. Where are they at? Are they just beginning to think about changing? Have they already started and explored it and feel pretty confident? Or are they so good now that they've incorporated these changes into their everyday lives? So a PRO such as the patient activation measure also lets you see readiness to change so that you can gear your intervention to the just right challenge for that person. And yet one more added value of a patient reported outcome is you can use them to assess global and specific changes in overall quality of life or life satisfaction as yet another outcome indicator. Here you're seeing an example from the World Health Organization Quality of Life um, instrument that asks the person to globally rate their quality of life and how satisfied they are with their health and then goes into a number of specific items related to um, rating their physical health, their psychological health, their social relationships, and access to environmental supports using a quality of life or life satisfaction assessment tool as a patient reported outcome is also a valuable way to see overall what was the impact of your intervention on this person's quality of life. But just a note, you want to choose quality of life assessments that have items specific to what you're trying to do in your service. Are you impacting community living, social participation, health? Then choose items um, and assessment tools that actually ask very specific items about that. So now you've gone through a number of different patient reported outcome measures and you've compared them to client-centered objective performance um, assessments as well. Now the question for you is how do you find all these patient reported outcomes in your busy day? Well, one tool that allows you to do that is something called the Rehabilitation Measures Database or the RMD. If you go to the website um, on this slide, you will see that the RMD um, is a large database full of outcome assessments. You can search on any term you'd like, such as activity, participation, falls, and any other term um, activities you might be working on, and it will link you to a series of assessments that are in its database that meet your criteria. From there, you can choose any of the assessments 
and it will take you to more information on their reliability, their validity, their cl uh, clinical utility, where to get them, how much they cost, and if you need any special training to use them. So the RMD is a really critical um, outcome tool for you to use so that you can find and link to the best outcome assessments um, for your practice. Take a few minutes now and go to the RMD and try searching. Try searching just on participation once and see what assessments you get. And then try some other searches specific to your practice. Finally, what we'd like to uh, link you to is a PROM PM or performance measure, um, a whole system that allows you to look at uh, self-report and patient-reported outcomes across a number of clients um, and across a number of different services and programs that you might provide. An example of one system is the PROMISE system, which stands for Patient Reported Outcomes Measurement Information System. And here on the slide you see the PROMISE website that you can go to. PROMISE is a roadmap activity for the National Institutes of Health. That means it was developed as a tool so that no matter what institute people are doing research in, they could use the self-report tools to look at the same things um, and be able to compare across studies these different patient-reported outcomes. If you go to PROMISE and a link called Assessment Center, it actually links you to the actual PROMISE assessments in many different areas, and you can see them here under physical functioning, mental health, and social health. Once you get there, you can also link on um, the computer adapted test demonstration on the right side of the screen. That will actually have you do a sample PROMISE assessment. So go there and try doing a PROMISE assessment on a sample client that you're working with now. It will ask you to put in the person's um, gender, their age, uh, and then it will ask you what kind of assessments do you want to do. Like do you want to measure their social participation, maybe their depression, maybe also their physical functioning. Once you've selected the set of assessments, the computer adapted testing um, tool will self-administer them to you and you answer. Uh, and then at the end of it, you will get a results uh, score sheet that shows you how this client compares to the database of thousands of people they have from the general population without disabilities. So you actually get a results page that could be used in your outcome documentation. PROMISE is a really important initiative because increasingly healthcare funders and providers are beginning to look to systems like this so that we can measure patient reported outcomes over time and compare them across settings or across services using this assessment um, tool. The other nice thing about PROMISE is it also links you to other tools specific to people with disabilities such as NeuroQual that has assessment, um, self-report assessments for people with spinal cord injury or traumatic brain injury or stroke. It also links you to the NIH Toolbox, an objective testing service that looks at things such as cognition, physical function, and social participation. Go to the Assessment Center now and try doing the computer-adapted test on a sample client so you can see what a report looks like. And finally, another example of why patient reported outcomes are so important in your outcome toolbox is the development of an entire institute related to it called the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, or PCORI. This institute is relatively new, and the mission of it is to look at patient engagement and patient-centered outcomes research and assessment tools. Um, to see if we use the perspective of the patient to drive our interventions, do we get better outcomes because of it? Um, and are we actually getting at what's most important to patients and meaningly involving them in their healthcare decision making at all stages of the research process? I encourage you to go to the PCORI website to see what some of the uh, research studies are that are ongoing to test this patient engagement hypothesis and to see if treatment is more effective with this approach. 
So now we're at the end of Module 2, where you've gotten a chance to see many different ways to put outcome measures into your everyday practice. What we'd like you to do now is, again, go back to that ICF worksheet that you did at the very beginning, and now we want you to put together your own outcome plan for your setting and your practice. Use the ICF worksheet to talk about what would you assess in terms of outcomes at the body function and structure, the activity, the participation, and the environment levels. Try to focus on those participation outcomes that are so important now to funders in everyday practice today, the long-term outcomes post-rehabilitation, and make sure that you select some kinds of outcomes assessments in that category. Use this attached chart um, to be able to put together your own outcome plan. After you've done that, take it back to the other people you work with or the service you work with and your team members and see if you want to add other tools to it or talk about ways or strategies you could use to share um, these outcome results across your team members and begin to get more coordinated care. This concludes the session for Module 2. What you'll be doing in Module 3 now is going into some critical information on how to understand and apply measurement principles more rigorously in your practice. And then in Module 4, it will summarize some ways for you to develop your own outcome plan and strategize potential barriers you might face to doing so. Thank you and enjoy the next modules.